Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it is time for our weekly Bible study. And today we're going to be going over Job chapters 23 and 24. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish usually two videos a week, a replay of that Bible study, as well as a video about books. So if you're interested in either of those things, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications so you can get updates to new videos. And uh, I have to tell you, we are in the book of Job. We're a little bit halfway through. This, I've mentioned this before, this entire Bible study has just been a fight to get through. I had a hard time getting started on it. I've had a hard time, like I've, I've been doing uh, live Bible studies for two years. I was really like didn't miss a week for two years and I have had a really hard time keeping this uh, steady it's just been really hard working through and and also like last time when I uh, last week on the Bible study on Job 22 I'd written the whole thing and then I don't know what happened like it froze up um, I did the Bible study just kind of going through it, you know just reading the passages and kind of remembering what I'd written I went back to my computer the, everything I'd written was gone. Over 2,000 words, completely missing. <sighs> not not happy about that. Then today, when I'm getting ready to go, again, my computer freezes up, and it took a while to, for this to start up again. I did get back into Scrivener where I wrote it. For a minute, I thought I had lost this one too, which would not be happy. But anyway, I do have it, so we're going to get into it. And uh, if you would like to see a replay of all the Bible studies I've done, you can go to racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. There's a page specifically for Job and you can go and see a collection of all the Bible studies if you want to go through it chapter by chapter. But anyway, before we get started, let's just start at this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and for this day. Lord, we thank you that you are so, so good to us and that you are our teacher and you're our guide. And we invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit, I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. Give us eyes that can see you clearly, give us ears that can hear your voice, and give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so this is Job chapters 23 and 24, and this is his response to Eliphaz in chapter 22, which we did that did last time. And this is Job's eighth response eight, eight times he's responded. And as I was reading the, like, that, I was just thinking, man, I think I would be exhausted at that point because think about it. He's gone through, um, all these calamities. He's lost his family. He's lost his fortune. He's lost his position. He is sick. He is tired. He is just completely, uh, devastated. His friends come and, after, you know, they sit there for a while, then they start kind of hounding him to confess to things that he didn't do. And, you know, he's at this point, I mean, put yourself in his position. Wouldn't you feel kind of worn down at this point? I think that one thing that we can take from Job, that this was really uh, highlighted to me in this particular section, is that it's important to persist. So in the beginning, in chapter three, you know, he's in the dark night of the soul and he is just thinking, nobody loves me. God doesn't care about me. And then the dialogue starts, right? And so as we see, this isn't just an account. There's just so many layers to the book of Job. But one of the things is it's, we see Job's spiritual journey from knowing that there is a God and one that he is supplicating to one that he is coming into relationship with and putting his reliance on. That is Job's spiritual journey. What this passage, uh, what it reminded me of was the parable of the persistent widow, because Job is, he starts with, as we'll see in uh, the beginning of chapter 23, he begins with a petition to God. He's still calling out to God for justice and he's persisting. Regardless of how many times his friends come against him, he is still persisting in his insistence. And he is, you know, the, the friends aren't going to God. They're not coming to Job and, and pr saying, hey, let's pray about this and let's go to God together and see what's going on here. 
They're just saying, admit it. And Job's saying, no, I want to go to God and I want him to, um, to vindicate me. If, if I'm wrong, he can, he can tell me I'm wrong. Uh, I was just reading one of the commentaries, um, that, you know, the difference between Job and his friends is that Job wants to go meet with God and his friends don't. So that kind of tells you the orientation of Job's heart, right? So this, again, going back to the parable of the persistent widow, you know, Jesus gives this parable as an example to his followers to be persistent, right? Anyway, in uh, Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, he said, And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought to always pray and not to lose heart. He said, In a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And we're going to talk a little bit about this, you know, the the same sort of thing is kind of, I think, uh, the writer of Job is actually speaking about. Um, So, and there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while, a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet, because this woman keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And so this is what Job is doing. He is persisting and he's continuing to call out to God and to demand justice. And we're going to see that that's, that is what he's been doing in here. So what I mentioned in the last lesson on um, Job 22 is that, so Eliphaz begins his dialogue, his response to Job, and he's still insistent Job is guilty, right? But then he goes into the next section. He goes into, isn't this, he lists all the things that will bring judgment. And we, we talked about that last week. You know, we talked a little bit about identificational repentance. And he's listing this. And Eliphaz is insistent, if Job hadn't done wrong, that this wouldn't be happening to Job, right? So he's listing the things in in uh, chapter 22, that he thinks Job has done. But, uh, you know, there's 42 chapters in the book of Job. When we get to 22, it's like right in the middle, right? And what I think is that that chapter is really giving us insight into the point that the writer of the book of Job had. Because what Eliphaz is describing is an oppressive ruler who um, is just doing things with impunity, like this unjust judge here, right? That he doesn't fear God or man. That's really the kind of person that Eliphaz is describing in the last part of 22. And we'll see that Job's response ties into that a little bit. But I think that is what the point of the book is, because sometimes it's hard for us to really get a handle on this and and understand it, you know, in the West, because, you know, we live in a country where we say all kinds of things that sometimes aren't even true with no recourse. Right. And so we have this right to express our opinion and say what we think, even if what we think is objectively wrong. Right. So that was not the case all the time. And so back in the time of Job, you spoke out uh, against the leader and you very likely could uh, be killed or put in prison or lose everything you can. You just couldn't go out and say whatever you thought, right? And so this is, you see this in, um, we were talking about this in, I don't even remember now, which it was one of my live streams, I think. We were talking about uh, how art is subversive a lot of times and that they write it in a story and they're calling things out because they can't say things publicly. Oh, I know what it was. It's on an unexpected journal uh, it's channel. It's called The Influences from the Past. And I was doing a discussion on my last article for an unexpected journal on Jesus and Aesop. But 
anyway, sometimes when you read something, you have to look at the hidden, the hidden message. And so Job is this huge long work. It's 42 chapters. It's in a chiastic structure. And so there's, you know, there's this pairing of these responses. So I think that's what it is. I think that's what it is that he was getting all the way to the middle. And then he's basically, um, describing what this oppressive ruler is doing. And I think we'll see at the end of this, this section that Job is kind of agreeing with him on some things. So anyway, we're going to go to chapter 23 and go start in verse one. Then Job answered and said, today also my complaint is bitter. My hand is heavy on account of my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would know what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, he would pay attention to me. There an upright man could argue with him and I would be acquitted forever by my judge. So this is the beginning of Job's response to life has. And Job is doing exactly what Jesus tells his followers to do in Luke. He's crying out to God and making his case, right? What you see here is that he is putting his trust in a God who is not only just, but is faithful, that will be faithful to the people who are righteous. When we were studying chapters 16 and 17, Job was saying that he knows that there's a mediator pleading his case as a man pleads for a friend. We've discussed this before that we think of you know, God as this triune God, right? But we tend to think of the spiritual world as just God and us, that we don't think about these other beings, right? And so when you, but when you read in Job, that's not the, that's not the description of the book of Job. And that's also not how people during that time would have seen it. There were God's all sorts of, they believed in all sorts of deities, all sorts of gods over, you know, different people, over things, over times of life. There were, you know, this, this whole unseen world populated with these other beings. And in the beginning of the book of Job, it, we have this picture of this divine council of these other divine beings beyond Yahweh that are coming in the presence of God. And there's this conversation between Satan and God where Satan challenges God, meaning Yahweh, to put Job to the test. In the beginning of Job's responses in chapter three, if you go back and read that, he is going through this dark night of the soul. He has had this fear of the Elohim of gods, and he kind of has this, this fuzzy idea of this sense of righteousness, but he doesn't feel like God cares about him. And so as he moves forward, like in chapter 16, 17, he says that there's, he knows that there's a mediator, mediator there pleading his case, right? And then in chapter 19, he goes beyond that. In chapter 19, verse 25, he says, for I know my redeemer lives and he will stand upon the earth at last, right? He's putting a trust in a God who will save him. And then we get to chapter 23 and he's come from chapter three, where he just feels like he's completely abandoned by God to 23, where he's saying, you know what? Not only do I want a mediator, I want to talk to God face to face. I want to have this conversation with him. So he's, he's progressing. He's pressing in. Then we're going to go down to verse eight. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there and backward, but I do not perceive him on the left hand. When he is working, I do not behold him. He turns to the right, but I do not see him, but he knows the way I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. So Job is seeking God, but he hasn't found him. And we see this passage. He said, I go forward. He's not there and backwards, but I do not perceive him. But on the left hand, when he's working. So it's like he can't see clearly, but he recognizes that God is present working. He's bringing things about, even though he doesn't really know what's going on. And he has confidence that God is ordering his path. He knows the way he will take. And not only does Job believe that God has good for him, that he has this plan that Job is wanting to follow after, right? But that God will work good in him, in Job. 
Job is saying, I will be refined like gold. So he recognizes that this is a trial. David actually wrote the same thing in one of his own trials in Psalm 66. This is starting in verse 8. Let the whole world bless our God and loudly sing his praises. Our lives are in his hands and he keeps our feet from stumbling. You have tested us, O God. You have purified us like silver. You captured us in your net and laid the burden of slavery on our back. Then you put a leader over us. We went through fire and flood, but you brought us to a place of great abundance. This is just a really shortened version, right? You could write an entire book or even an entire library on the themes of these four verses. But what David is pointing out here in the psalm is that sometimes that it is the very thing that seems like the calamity is the thing that brings us to this place of great abundance. And if we hadn't gone through that trial, if we hadn't gone through that refining process, we wouldn't be able to take hold of it or even handle it. You know, if, if it had just come to us without us going through that refining process. And Isaiah actually refers to that Fire, refining process as the furnace of affliction. And in Isaiah 48, he writes, Yes, I will tell you of things that are entirely new, things you have never heard of before. For I know so well what traitors you are. You have been rebels from birth, yet for my own sake and for the honor of my name, I will hold back my anger and not wipe you out. I have refined you. But not as silver is refined, rather I have refined you in the furnace of suffering. I will rescue you for my sake, yes, for my own sake. I will not let my reputation be tarnished, and I will not share my glory with idols. In this passage, Isaiah is um, he's writing the words of the Lord to the Israelites, who are coming under judgment because they have not you know, followed God's laws. They have taken their position cheaply, right? And he tells them that God will keep his covenant promise, not because they deserve it, because they've been rebels since birth, but for the glory of his own name, that he is just, and that in spite of everything that, that, that they've done, that even when we don't deserve it, that God will rescue them. So Israel's being put through a refining process and God will rescue them because he is faithful, right? So let's go back to the words of Job, and this is down in verse 11 on Chapter 23, my foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of my, his mouth more than my portion of food. But he is unchangeable and who can turn him back? What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me. And many such things are in his mind. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence when I consider I am in dread of him. God has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. Yet I am not silenced because of the darkness, nor because thick darkness covers my face. So we've discussed before that part of the difficulty of understanding Job is um, sometimes it can be the translations themselves. So uh, part of that is just because it's uh, there's words that are unique to the book of Job that they don't have any cross-reference to not only in the Bible, but anything else. Um, the, to the topic is just hard, right? The problem of evil is, is a hard subject. And also what complicates the matter is that sometimes the way a passage is translated can be heavily influenced by, you know, the, the translators, theological doctrines and their preconceptions. So sometimes I can go into it with an understanding already without just kind of sitting there and listening to what the words say. So this can cause slight shifts in the meaning. And I think we see that a little bit here. So we kind of need to like think about, um, I think when you read Job, you kind of have to always try to put yourself in the place of Job, in the place of his culture, and think about how he understood the world and his vision of it. And then as you try to do that, read and listen to the words and like, okay, what, what do you think he's meaning here? So, um, if you want to go back, I kind of go into this a little bit more depth in the Bible study on Job 19. We talked about this more. I'm reading out of the ESV, but I think if you read that alone, 
it would come across as if God himself was doing this inflicting, right? And we discussed this earlier that he realizes that there are other entities that are interacting in his life. So Job realizes this. Sometimes we forget that, but he didn't know the specific situations, but he was aware of this. I read this same section in Young's literal translation, and to me it comes across a little bit differently. So this is in verse 13, and he is in one mind, and who doth turn him back? And his soul hath desires, and he doth it. For he doth complete my portion, and many such things are with him. Therefore, from his presence, I am troubled, I consider, and I am afraid of him. And God hath made my heart soft, and the mighty hath troubled me. For I have not been cut off before darkness, and before me he covered thick darkness. So when I read this, to me it says that Job is acknowledging that God sets the plans for his life. And that what God has appointed for him will come to pass. I think when he says that this this greatness, like the the power of the Almighty, he controls every single thing. And when you think about that, that can be intimidating, right? I think that's what Job means when his heart has made soft, or sometimes they translate it as faint. It reminds me of the verse, um, of the same thing that the writer of Hebrews wrote in, um, this is in chapter 10, verse 31. Uh, he writes, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And so I think that is the same thing that Job is saying. He realizes that God is great. When you think about the magnitude of that, it can be a little bit overwhelming. Verse 17, for I have not been cut off before darkness, and before me he covered thick darkness. This is how the net translator explained that. And they wrote, this is a very difficult verse. The Hebrew text literally says, for I have not been destroyed because of darkness and because of my faith, which gloom has covered. Most commentators admit the negative adverb, which gives the meaning that Job is enveloped in darkness and reduced to terror. The verb nitsmadi means I have been silent. And so obviously the negative must be retained. He has not been silent. Let's read this again, what, they, what the Hebrew actually says. For I have not been destroyed because of darkness. So he's in the midst of it, but he's saying, I haven't been destroyed on this. I'm still going to get up. And he said, and I've not been silent. So he is persisting, right? That's the message that Job has. I've been through it. I'm still in it, but I'm still pushing forward. I will still persist and I'm still counting on God to deliver me. This reminds me of um, Psalms 138.8 and David writes, really almost the same thing. The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. Same thing Job is saying. So we're going to continue on chapter 24, where Job is continuing to point out wrongdoing and asking why God does next. So remember, in chapter 22, Eliphaz, still sure that Job is the one at fault, and he lists everything that can bring about judgment. This is what he thinks Job has done. And so this chapter in 24 really ties into that. And what Job is saying, hey, look, all these things are going on. Do you see people being called to account? Let's read what these wrongdoings are. Why are not times of judgment kept by the Almighty? And why do those who know him never see his days? Some move landmarks. They seize flocks and pasture them. They drive away the donkeys of the fatherless. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. They thrust the poor off the road. The poor of the earth all hide themselves. So I'm going to stop here for a second. So Job is the oldest book in the Bible, right? And these are things he's saying that will bring about judgment. Um, the next time you read through the Old Testament, read through the books of law, which are the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, specifically Leviticus through Deuteronomy. See how what Job is listing here lines up with the instructions the Israelites are given in the Old Testament on how they're to operate. And they're told they have a choice. They can either choose to follow God's instructions and his laws and live with integrity and they will receive a blessing or they will receive a curse if they violate them. And as we said last week, we were going over chapter 22. We also looked at the book of Micah where 
the Israelites did not follow those instructions, and Micah is almost repeating, like word for word, what Eliphaz said would bring judgment. He's saying this is what the Israelites had done. And so in this section here, Job is actually agreeing with Eliphaz that these things bring judgment. But what he's saying is, this is going on in front of you. Are you seeing immediate judgment? This is what he's saying. And just to speak a little bit to what he's describing. Some move landmarks and seize flocks and pasture them. So this is people's resources. There were people that were stealing property from other people that own them, stealing their resources. They drive away the donkey, the fatherless. So this donkey and the widow's ox, this is how they could work their fields and produce things and their resources are being stolen. Okay, they thrust the poor off the road, the poor of the earth all hide themselves. So they're exploiting the poor. Behold, like wild donkeys in the desert, the poor go out to their toil seeking game. The wastelands yield food for their children. They gather their fodder in the field. They glean the vineyard of the wicked man. They lie all night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They're wet with the rain of the mountains and cling to the rock for lack of shelter. There are those who snatch the fatherless child from the breast, and they take a pledge against the poor. They go about naked, without clothing, hungry, they carry the sheaves. Among the olive rows of the wicked they make oil, they tread the wine presses, but suffer thirst. So they're working, but they're not getting any reward for their work, or pay for their work, right? From out of the city the dying groan, and the soul of the wounded cries for help, yet God charges no one with wrong. This first section of chapter 24 is really echoing what Eliphaz is saying. He's saying, you're right, this does should bring about judgment. But this is going on, and it hasn't been brought to account. Down in verse 13. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways, and do not stay in its path. The murderer rises before its light, that he may kill the poor and needy, and in the night he is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer waits for twilight, saying, No one will see me. And he veils his face. In the dark they dig through houses. By day they shut themselves off. They do not know the light, for deep darkness is morning to all of them. For they are friends with the terrors of deep darkness. So Job is describing people that are so corrupt in spirit that they welcome darkness. They, they go after evil. Um, they're the ones who rebel against the light, right? Verse 18, you say, swift are they on the face of the waters. Their portion is cursed in the land. No treader turns towards their vineyard. Drought and heat snatches away like snow waters. So does Sheol who have sinned. The womb forgets them. The worm finds them sweet. They are no longer remembered. So wickedness is broken like a tree. They wrong the barren childless woman and do no good to the widow. Yet God prolongs the life of the mighty by his power. They rise up when they despair of life. He gives them security and they are supported and his eyes are upon their ways. They are exalted a little while and then they are gone. They brought, they are brought low and gathered up like all others. They are cut off like the heads of grain. If it is not so, who will prove me a liar and show there is nothing in what I say? He's saying that, you know, you say, that they're going to get a an immediate curse on them, that their portion is cursed in the land, and that they're not going to have children, um, that they'll die early, right? He's saying, this is what you're saying. But Job is responding and saying, that's not always true. Yet God prolongs the long life of the mighty by his power. They rise up when they despair of life. So what this is, is like the, the mighty become sick and they recover. That he's prolonging their life it, when they he gives them a return of their their life and their health when they've lost all hope so job is saying it's not necessarily true that the righteous are the ones who will come through in sickness right he's saying that's not always true sometimes the wicked do so eliphaz is looking at the judgment coming in this life and what job is saying that's that's not always true it's not always true, but what he's saying is whether they, and this is a repeat of what Job has said before, 
whether someone is rich, rich or poor, righteous or unjust, that they're going to all end in the same place. They're exalted for a little while and then they're gone. They are brought low and gathered up like all the others. They're cut off like heads of grain. Everyone dies in the end. But we still see the same thing today, right? That is still the same thing that's going on. It's not, all, we're in the middle of a time of pandemic. It's not always the righteous people that are the ones that come through. There's people, if this were the only justice was in this life, you'd say there is no justice. But this isn't the end. And so this kind of goes back to the point of the whole book. The question is, what is the point of life? If there's no justice in this life, what's the point? And the point is, or the point, is that this isn't the end. That yes, there will be justice. But, you know, we're given this life and we're, we are given resources and blessings, right? And so whatever we're given, we will be called to account for how we use them. Jesus talks about this in a couple of his parables. It's the parable of the talents and the parable of the unjust steward. You know, there's different uh, Christian denominations get uh, have different ideas about how works factor in, right? So we're, we're saved by faith. We, we put our trust in God for salvation. Some people don't think that what we do after that point has anything to do with that salvation. And so there's debate about that. But I don't think there's any debate about the fact that there will be rewards. And what we do in this life with what God has given us, regardless of how you think the sanctification process plays in, what you do, you will be called for account for. And some people think that God helps those who help themselves is a verse. It's not a Bible verse. That's not a Bible verse. What is a Bible verse is too much is given, much is required. So you will be called to account for how you use what you've been given. So if you've been given a lot, whether that's in terms of resources or whether that's in terms terms of position or influence, that should make you stop and think a little bit. You, you should be maybe a little nervous about that because you will answer to God for, for what it is that you've been given. Again, the writer of Hebrews said, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. You have to answer for that. So God gives us these blessings. He also gives us the opportunity to make a choice. We have free will. And so he gives us the opportunity to make decisions on how we're going to respond with that. If we didn't truly have a choice on how to use what he's given us and how to respond in certain situations, then God couldn't truly give us rewards, right? So there are going to either be rewards or judgments for what it is you do. But if we didn't truly have an opportunity to take action, then we wouldn't get either. Let's go back to Job specifically. So why Job? So we know he was a righteous man, but he still went through all these trials. So so what is what is the point? And I think the key to this whole section is in verse 10 in chapter 23, when he says, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tried me, I shall come out as gold. This is what happens when we put our trust in people rather than our trust in God. It doesn't matter who somebody is, they can always fall off the wagon. They can get off track. Somebody can be a righteous person doing good things and then they fall away. I honestly think if you look back like five years ago, there's a period of time when there were a ton of people um, that were dying. And the, the Christian leaders that were dying, passing away. You know, these illnesses and some weird accidents. And... Some of those deaths were a shock. But I truly believe that for some of those people, that maybe the reason God didn't answer prayers for healing or save from a calamity was because if they had lived, they might have gotten themselves into a mess. They might have been like Balaam and ended up selling out. I also have an article on my website that was talking about the man of God, the voice of God and the prophet. And this man about God goes and follows God's instructions, but then he kind of stops a little bit and he ends up 
dying because he didn't specifically follow God's instructions. Solomon's the same thing. He started out well. Did he finish well? No, he didn't. He fell away. And because of his really apostasy, I mean, you can say we don't really know where Solomon ended up, but he didn't stay the course. And because of that, the kingdom was divided after him, under his son, the kingdom was divided. So just because somebody starts well doesn't mean that they'll finish well. And so Job had a good beginning, right? And so maybe, just maybe, that if Job hadn't been through this trial, if he hadn't come to into this closer relationship with God, if he hadn't personally experienced what it was like to be poor and destitute and abandoned, if he hadn't had that firsthand experience, maybe he would have fallen away, right? Maybe he would have gotten off track. You know, God's plan always was to bless him over and above what he had before. That was always in God's plan. But if he hadn't been through this dark time and this trial, maybe that wouldn't have been a blessing to him. Maybe it would have ended up being a curse. That's just some food for thought. That is Job chapter 23 and 24. And again, if you'd like to go back and watch some of the other Bible studies or read through them. You can go to my website at racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. You can go through all of them. You can also, there's also a podcast version on there as well. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can go to racetowalk.org forward slash give. And anyway, um, we will be continuing on with Job chapter 25 next week, but let's end this time with a prayer. We thank you so much for this time and for this day. We thank you that you have good plans for us, that you are bringing us to your good end and that you work out all things for good for those who love you and are called according to your name. So we put our trust in you, Lord. We thank you that you are bringing us to your good end. And I pray for the favor and blessing of God to reach personal lessons in Jesus name. Amen. Okay. Well, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.